wanted music to free our souls, so help us rock again, so help us. Hi, welcome to another edition of Measure for Measure. My name is Sean Casey. I'm very thrilled today to be interviewing my, my good friend who's soon to be uh, leaving us for Far Out West. Uh, the songwriter and singer and artist in, in many, many media, uh, Lynn Charles Foster, also known as Chuck Foster. I met Chuck uh, a few years ago and um, have enjoyed his company and uh, have shared a stage with him and a microphone many times. So welcome, Chuck, and thank you for, for thank coming. You. Yeah, good to be here. Before you, uh, let me give a word of explanation. Uh, the reason why I'm saying he's heading out west is Chuck is uh, is moving out to Oregon, where uh, he had actually uh, moved east from. So uh, heading heading back again. So yep, lived in. Born in New York, lived in Southern California, moved to Oregon, lived there 40 years, and then started following the grandchildren and ended up in Vermont for about four years. So, mm -hmm. wow. so now going back to Oregon, know everybody, relatives, less snow <laughs> yeah. and cheaper. <laughs> well, our, uh, our loss is Oregon's gain, but uh, you've made a lot of good friends here, so we'll talk about, uh, about that and your musical roots here, which are going to remain in in Vermont, mm -hmm. but uh, we uh, heard a song here that uh, at the start here that Chuck did, which was a uh, a song that he did about called the children of rock and roll. You are the children of rock and roll, mm -hmm. and um, I'd like to touch on that because it kind of goes with what I see as sort of a, a, a theme, if you will, if you of your music about sort of the the legacy or the heritage of of music you know and um, 
about sort of people picking up that that mantle of uh, of uh, of music and carrying it forward. Can you tell me who some of your favorite influences over the years were musically? Well, you know, it's going to be it's going to be like uh, Bob Dylan and the Beatles and the Doors and then the Beach Boys, which is the West Coast thing that the East Coast people don't get. Uh, you know, um, because that's where I live so much of my time. But um, and the children of rock and roll thing was just um, I was right when I started writing again after taking so many years off. I went back to I was we were in uh, classic car clubs and kind of reliving the 50s and 60s in the cars. And so the first song I wrote uh, was called Old School. And it was about riding around in a car and how cool it was. It was very 50s. But then a lot of my songs were tending to be in that kind of theme, that, uh, that 50s sound, or, you know, 60s sound. And then I w started thinking about how in classic cars, the people, th there were, most of the people that had the classic cars were older people. And they had trouble getting younger people to get involved in the, in, in, in the, the, uh, the club or to, to enjoy classic cars. And so that just kind of went off into the same thing with music about, you know, okay, where's this music gonna, what's gonna keep it alive? And, you know, uh, there's so much music that you see that's, that's in sheet music from the 20s that nobody ever plays, or, you know, how are you gonna keep this alive? And, uh, you know, it's gotta be the young folks that, that pick up on it. And there's many of the young folks that revive uh, older songs and are redoing them. One of the things that, uh always impresses me about you is is that you're anything but an aficionado of just older classic music i mean that your your tastes are very varied and uh, and very eclectic and you had the uh uh wonderful opportunity that of of many people who are, are much younger than you who, who would love to have seen kurt cobain perform and uh, tell me about that uh, that concert when you went to see Nirvana. Yeah, we, my wife and I got a chance to go and see that. Um, I had students, because I taught high school, and the students wanted, they were going to go, and they knew we liked uh, that kind of music because we were tired of disco and tired of canned music. We liked the, the, the live grunge sound being out there in, in Oregon and uh, in that area. And uh, yeah, they, they helped us get tickets. So we got tickets to it, and we went to the concert, and. Uh, one of my co-workers actually crowd surfed across and on, on it, but uh, I watched uh, um, Kurt Cobain play and he broke a string and he, uh, he just kept right on playing, you know, uh, didn't let anything phase him, just let uh, Pat Smear from the Germs that was playing with him take over and he just kept playing and didn't bought, nothing phased him, you know, uh, and the crowd was actually boiling. I've never seen anything like it. The intensity of that concert was absolutely amazing. And <laughs> you'd had to be there. That's the only way you'd know. But it's mm -hmm. amazing. And I, I just love that. But um, I like any kind of music that has some intensity to it that's real, mm -hmm. um, is about something. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say, I think that the way I look at that song, you know, the uh, You Are the Children of Rock and Roll, is that, uh, you know, that uh, it's it's a legacy to to be sort of a mantle to be to be carried forward you know and and reinterpreted and and you know in true artist form you know and uh and so the music keeps evolving but still has the you know still has its its pedigree if you will you know yeah it's um it's, it's the kind of song that you can't write if you're younger. Mm -hmm. You have to be older to kind of see that picture. You know, and you get the, you get a little different view. Uh, I'm a little older and I can't get up on stage and do the things that I probably could have done when I'm 20. There's some arthritis and all these kinds of things, but there's no arthritis in how I see things mm -hmm. in, my, in my thinking and, and the songs that come to me now, there's just so many of them, they just, they just, pop into my head and I just mm -hmm. write them all down and it's just weird to be able to do that <laughs> after all these years. Mm -hmm. Now you are not just a, 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 you know, a sound artist, but you're also have, you know, have been had quite an extensive career as a visual artist 
and uh, and in teaching the visual arts. Can you tell us, uh, tell me about your your art background and uh, you know and what what types of media you've you've uh, you know dabbled in over the years? Yeah, I, I painted for over 50 years, uh, or did art for over 50 years. I started when I was a little kid, um, and my uncle inspired me because he was he liked to paint. And as uh, my other uncles are musicians, so there's kind of no escaping that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I started painting and I did landscapes and kind of taught myself a little bit and had great instruction in high school, and then uh, went to college and learned about all the other kinds of art forms there could be and started learning how to work in abstract ways and different different types of art. But as I kept going on through things, I started, uh, I went into pottery, I did pottery for a while and I just tried all kinds of things, but I kept drawing and kept painting and I got to the point where I was doing very expressive paintings in the 80s, the time of MTV, the time of, of some of the first music coming out uh, in that uh, that time period, uh, the new wave time, and I started doing paintings that were very abstract. Um, then I did very 1984 Orwellish kind of things, Orwellian things, uh, paintings of factories and smog and things that I was thinking about when I lived in Southern California. Factories uh, belching out all kinds of smoke and and uh, some really heavy paintings. And at that time, I did. Uh, I was showing, I, I showed at the Portland Art Museum, I showed at several museums, um, had write-ups in Art Week, uh, which is a big art newspaper, got going quite well. I actually, I think it was well over 250 shows, got juried into everything and I was jurying things, but I did find that when the spotlight came on and at, at those shows that you really, it didn't last long, it really was that 15 minutes of fame and I didn't really care about it so much. Um, I did go into sculpture. I had, uh, a very good friend, uh, David Gilhooley, who was a very close friend who was a originator of California funk art, very famous um, sculptor, and influenced me to create uh, sculptures. And I started making things out of recycled plastic, um, lots and lots of sculptures. The plastic did lots of shows with that, which did really well with the critics, but they, you couldn't sell them, nobody would buy plastic. Uh, and at the end, I got rid of most of those sculptures and did a few pieces of pottery using plastic and melting it and making phony pottery, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So I did a lot of art and then I retired from uh, teaching art and then I picked up my guitar, which I hadn't been playing very much over the years uh, since the 70s and started playing again and mm -hmm. uh, got uh, um, started writing songs and then I just went off into that. It's just crazy. Now, uh, how, how long did you teach? I taught for, uh, let's see, 30 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I taught high school, middle school, and every night I taught for the community college, I taught art at night. So I'd work in the daytime and then I'd go and teach wow. classes at night and painting and drawing and um, watercolor, different kinds of things. So I taught a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of art classes. So all types of ages from little kids to mm -hmm. old people, people with emotional problems. Mm -hmm. I worked in, I uh, taught some group homes. Mm -hmm. did that, did yeah. About every kind of kind of teaching you could do, I did. And now how does I didn't the, teach uh, music. I'm sorry. How does the inspiration of, uh, of, that you get from a song, how might it be different or similar to, say, the inspiration you might have gotten for a, uh, for a sculpture or a piece of pottery? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's not too hard to explain. Um, I, um, all of my art or music is autobiographical in some way. You have to live in order to create things like that. Uh, if you, you, know, you have to experience things, you have to be exposed to things. And so with, uh, when I'm working with, uh, in the visual arts, I would visualize things already done. I would visualize a sculpture. I would visualize a painting. I would just get an idea and I'd sketch it out and it'd be the same, be done. And then I'd maybe do some tweaks when I was working on it. And a lot of people don't understand how that happens, but I could just see it. I knew what I wanted. And the same happens with my music. Uh, I'll be, I'll get up in the morning and I'll have a song in my head and I'll go, uh, I don't think anybody already did that one. And I'll start to record it and, and I'll go, yep. That's a new one, and I'll start writing lyrics. And I'll, I used to write poetry all the time too, so that's, that also has something to do with it. 
and I just start writing and a lot of times the good songs they'll just be they'll just fall out I'll just have um, three verses and a chorus and they're done uh, mm -hmm. and then go back and then tweak them and try to take the stupid things out of it my wife goes and and we'll say uh, that one that part's not too clear or something and she'll help me with those things mm -hmm. and, and I'll I'll, I'll uh, make her suffer for it you know because especially <laughs> when something's new I just you know I'm just ah what do you mean you don't understand it or something but she always does <laughs> she's usually right so and, I, and then I step back from it and then go oh yeah and I'll make some changes and try to make it work so she gets the, the sad duty of being my critic either visual art or you know, musically mm -hmm. both things and how long has she had that position uh, we're going up on 40 years there you go. <laughs> 40 years, yeah, it'll be August, and so that's coming up. Nice. Yeah. We were going to go to Reno for the 40th, but <laughs> we may drive there because we'll be so much closer. That's right. <laughs> now, the, um, one of the, the things that the song we're going to hear you do is a song uh, that you wrote actually about 1970, you were saying. Can you give me a little bit of background about the song and then... We're going to hear it, and then we're uh, then I'd like to ask you some more questions about it, if we could. Yeah, I was going through a notebook that I had of covers that I used to play way back in the 70s because I needed to learn covers to play out because I was just starting my musical career when I retired. So I hadn't played out. I hadn't played open mics. I hadn't played anything, so it was all new. And so I was looking through a notebook trying to find some songs, and I went through there, and I went, there's, these are all songs I wrote in 1970 and 71 and 72. And I started to play them a little bit and realized that I remembered the melodies to them, which was incredible because I didn't have them uh, recorded. So as I played them, I actually recorded them to make sure that I wouldn't lose the melody again. And so I, I recorded those and uh, I ended up with uh, several songs. I think there were 14 or 15 songs that I'd written back in 1970 and this particular song I I, I played it for my uh, music producer friend uh, in Indianapolis I played one of the songs from the 70s and it was kind of funny uh, and um, he uh, he listened to it and said oh, I really like that man and I, and I said well I wrote that one 1970 he goes what you know yeah so they really were classic songs and it was um, like that uh, elevator song is about the times, um, it's, it's the, um, you know, Vietnam was going on and um, I didn't end up in Vietnam because I got a high uh, lottery number, otherwise I would have, like my brother, uh, you know, it's just the way that works out, but uh, um, that was about Vietnam and then there's things about just the society in general uh, is in that song and it's real, it was from the time. All right, so let's listen to Life is an Elevator. Life's an elevator, it goes up, it goes down. Feel the power surge as they push me to the ground. Third floor was my try with love. Second floor, the same as above. First floor, you lock the back door. everybody out. Honor all my bosses That's my burial ground Just like a dirty booklet They pass me around Third floor My name on the door Second floor, I'm middle class floor. First floor, on time every day as we hit the ground. And it's everybody out.
keep my eyes open I'm lost and I'm found I'm like a toy soldier As they push me around Life's an elevator, it goes up, it goes down. Feel the power surge as they push me to the ground. Third floor was my try with love. Second floor, the same as it fought. Third floor. Now about that, that song, Chuck, which was a very riveting song, I was uh, not surprised once you once you explained it to me. Um, it had some some very definitive and, and jarring even uh, imagery of it, uh, particularly of of the dove. Mm -hmm. Now, can you can you mention that line and? Uh, it's just one. Uh, it was almost a. a it's um, it's the uh, first floor we uh, they murdered the dove, and that was the part about um, you know third floor. I'm off to a war at Vietnam, and a lot of my friends from high school were in that. Uh, I didn't, and then uh, second floor. Um, I can't ask what for because you know that was you you couldn't protest. You weren't supposed to protest. Protesting was a big big problem um, and then uh, the murdered the dove was just that peace was just struggling so and they just were killing peace and that's mm -hmm. that was the image that I had and it was kind of a, a cry out for that as if I remember correctly because that was a lot of years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1970 yeah but still uh, that image is, is still very real you know and and, and uh, you know about you know a life having an ups those ups and downs, but also that, that uh, you know, you're in an elevator and, and you don't even have control of the buttons. No, no. <laughs> that it's opening on these floors and, yeah. and you, you're you thrust out in the world to, uh, you know, to make your make your way. Yeah, it could be romance, which is the first part, and now everybody goes through that. You don't seem like you have control of that. And the second part, second verse was about getting a job and making it, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, you start at the top and then you might end up at the bottom and you're doing the same thing everybody else does so yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> now what uh now that i mean it's amazing to to look back on that and with the um you know we still talk about staying relevant as as far as music you know we still keep revisiting you know war and also always that that question, you know, about what is a just war? When is it? Does it exist? You know, and 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 people, you know, ask to to make incredible sacrifices and and and, and you know, and to be part of of a bigger scheme of things and to trust that the higher ups have their have everyone's best. Uh, uh, best fortunes in mind and sometimes you know we've learned that wasn't quite the case you know? no i've had every i think i've had a relative in every war mm -hmm. my dad was world war ii my grandfather world war one uh, my great grandfather civil war and then war of 1812 <laughs> I'll clear back to revolution i've had mm -hmm. we've just been in line every time so yeah. <laughs> uh you know and then but i i, I wasn't at this time my brother was and mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that but he was, made it home safely. he made it home but he couldn't 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 survive all of it it was too stressful for him mm -hmm. so it finally caught up with him yeah 
And now the um, you'd mentioned that you have a a legacy of, of music in the family. Yeah, my uh, grandfather was uh, a violinist for the Chicago Symphony, and uh, my great uncle sang on the first uh, broadcast radio broadcast from Chicago, from the Edgewater Beach Hotel. He was a crooner, and he would sing. Uh, it became a big time jazz station after that. Uh, and uh, I even have a sheet, piece of sheet music with his picture on it that I got on eBay, which was incredible that somebody would mm -hmm. have saved it enough for me to connect and find it. There couldn't have been more than 20 out there originally. But uh, yeah, and he did music in, um, in there with all the biggies back there in the, mm -hmm. in the 20s. And, uh, but then, then go further to that, my mom played piano. Uh, my uncle and uh, two uncles sang and played bass and they'd play in a trio in New York City, you know, um, uh, lots of musicians in, in the family on my mom's side. My dad's side, farmers. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, how early on did you pick up the guitar? Uh, I started in, uh, let's see, in the 60s, uh, probably about maybe 64, 65, around Beatles time. Um, my uncle played guitar and we used to do family sing-alongs and my mom would play piano. My uncle was a great singer. He'd get asked to sing everywhere like you. He's, he has that kind of voice like you have, a great voice. And uh, he'd get asked to play and sing. And then, uh, so he showed me how to play guitar some. And then I learned on my little tiger striped um, Montgomery Ward or Sears guitar. I don't remember which it was. Anyway, I have one like it now. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, we did family sings, so mm -hmm. that's that's how I learned. Taught myself. Now you like like every guitarist, uh, uh, you are polyamorous. You have uh, several guitars, and show us the one you have. Uh, my my guitar arsenal. Yes, yes, yes guitar I have several. <laughs> yeah, this one is this is a uh, a handmade guitar that's uh, it's called an American Acoustech and it was made in Rochester. And the guys who made it work for, um, uh, let's see, I think of the company, one of the major, major companies, guitar makers, but um, they got the Rochester School of Design to do the sound work for it. So that's why it has a particular sound to it. And uh, they hand made them, they made about 700 of these things, and then they quit, they went out of business because it cost them too much to make them. Uh, the mm -hmm. guitar is very bassy. It, it uh, doesn't get uh, pitchy going up. It doesn't get sharper much. It stays really, really in tune. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has a nice bass tone to it. But it's signed inside and everything. But we got this one up in, in Maine. We were in an antique store up there. And my wife found it in the corner uh, in, a, in a guitar case, a little cheap guitar case. And uh, I went over and looked at it and goes, well, anything that's in an antique store sitting around can't possibly be in tune too much and I started to pick it up and play it and the thing was totally in tune. I went, ah, this thing is amazing. And so I bought it and uh, it's, um, there aren't that many of them around, but boy, I tell you, they're great, great for tone for, mm -hmm. you want it to work, but you have to, mm -hmm. you have to want that kind of full bass sound. It's a nice sound. Now you name all your instruments. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is? Yeah, this is Warren. This is named after your, after Warren Zevon. No, actually it's <laughs> named, Second and the and the second hand because uh, your dog's named after Warren Zevon Warren and then this I named this guitar after Warren yes, and I, in honor I'd of I appreciate Warren. it you you had said what should we name it and I said well how about Warren Warren so. good yeah I have Warren I have Stella mm -hmm. uh, Maria uh, Freddie Fender mm -hmm. makes sense doesn't it and uh, Opie from my uh, Opie is my um, my tailor I have a little tailor Opie Taylor. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a little double anyway, entendre. Anyway, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the, you have a Fender Strat, and that is? Yeah. 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 I have Strat, and that, that's Freddie Fender. That's Freddie Fender. Oh. Yeah. And then Maria okay. is my Ibanez, and uh, I have a 12 string, and, and uh, lots of guitars. But each guitar has a different song in it. It has a different sound, and I, I find that I write songs, different songs will come into my head when I'm playing a particular guitar. So. I think it's mm -hmm. kind of like having different brushes or different colors to work with, mm -hmm. uh, different paints. I think it's very similar, and I think it's important to to have that that choice. I, I'm not a one guitar person. I would mm -hmm. I would have a room full if I could, 
and old ones, beat up, you know, kind of ones and ones that are have a real high jangly sound, kind of like mm -hmm. the Taylors or something like that. But mm. it makes a difference. Now the uh, I assume that the trip out west is going to be uh, the source of a lot of inspiration. Oh, usually life is. Mm. Yeah. I never know, but I don't try to write songs. I never have, uh, and they'll they'll just come into my head or they don't. And so far, they mm. continue to do that. Um, I've written several here lately as we're getting ready to go. I have new ones, and mm -hmm. and then some turn out to be to be better, and they they outlive the others, and they become the ones that I play more often. But uh, um, I think I'm well over 100 songs here in the, since I started writing songs in like the summer of 19 or 2007 this time I wrote mm -hmm. some before that but uh, wrote those on 12 string I had a 12 string back in the 70s mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. so a lot of the songs elevator was written on the 12 string but I hadn't been playing it that way I kind of like the bassy sound in this mm -hmm. nice yeah. and uh, so the what would you uh, any particular favorite I, I know the Bee Gees uh, were interviewed once, and they said, "Well, it's like picking your favorite child." So, you say, if "Any any song particularly stand out to you, of all your your works, or are they pretty much all like like children and hard to pick a favorite?" Well, it's it's hard. It's like trying to pick a favorite painting. I've never been able to do that. I have some that I like for a while, then some I don't. You know, it kind of changes around. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I like I like Naked to the World. That one's pretty good. I like that one. And uh, uh, the I have several other ones that are on my CD. That's I do have an album, but it's it's still getting uh, mastered. And when I go back to Oregon, we're going to stop in Indianapolis. I'm going to sing and finish up on that with my uh, producer Tim Brickley, who's has an Emmy, and uh, and uh, work with him, and then hopefully it'll get done. But I, I, there are several songs on that that I like. Uh, we all fall down is on there. I like that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, uh, loves Magic Garden. Mm -hmm. But I, and I, I like surf songs too, so I write I write uh, surf instrumentals too. Mm -hmm. So the um, you do have a website. This so is when when that album comes out, people will be able yeah, to yeah. hunt it down be easy to find yeah it just you can go to uh, you can go to reverb nation slash Chuck Foster and you can find music there right now and then you can also go uh, it'll be on uh, uh, it'll be on Lynn Charles Foster or actually it's uh, Chuck Foster music dot com is the music Chuck Foster music dot com right? yeah really? but uh, yeah you can get it on reverb reverb nation or you can find it on Facebook but when I finally get it out, <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a process. But well, I took yeah. two well, two years to record it, going up and working on it. But I didn't know anything about studio work at all. I never recorded anything. I just got so lucky to get somebody that would show me how to do all of it and be so patient mm -hmm. because I was scared to death. I was scared to death to even perform when I came here in Vermont. That's the the advantage of Vermont. So many open mics. So many friendly. Uh, musicians that are willing to step in and help you like you know I played uh, over uh, uh, open mic with Carol Ann Jones which was a real opportunity I played with uh, uh, um, Wiley Shipman down at in uh, on tap and then I got to play certainly with Jack Grimmer at Twigs and you know there's just so many and Kyle Stevens um, at uh, T-Bones way back I played there but as I played I got less and less nervous and I could handle it and mm -hmm. so you know I I learned tons by being in Vermont what a great training ground for me mm -hmm. yeah and there is a real community of, of, mm. of artists and in this age of sort of being everybody's a DIY musician there aren't a, you know the the business model of the old you know the huge record company is is pretty much gone except for for a few and everyone is is pretty much you know, uh, doing it themselves by some way, shape, or form. So it's great, but it's great to see that there is this camaraderie that exists. Yeah, it's really hard to hard to re record on your own for one thing. That's really uh, that's another world. But um, it's nice. I was actually getting got a chance to to play. My producer was saying, "You got to jam with people. You got to learn how to 
you know, play in a band because I had never done that. You know, I'd always played solo, even in the 70s, you know, I didn't play with a band. I tr actually started to play with a garage band one time, you know, a long time ago. They needed a lead player and I, had, I was the one with the electric guitar, but I wasn't very good at it. So, you know, I mean, that's, hadn't, hadn't grown enough, but uh, yeah, we got to play uh, here and play with you and, and others and, and play in the Caveman, our little band, and uh, actually experience things that I never would have been able to do unless we'd come to Vermont. So, mm. you know, it's a, a, a great place to learn and uh, you know, uh, couldn't get a better school. Mm. And now, of course, you have uh, more people in your musician circle, and that will stay the same because, you know, uh, we're through the wonder of the internet. You can put mm -hmm. something up, and yep. and we can hear it, and yep. you know, and uh, so that's the nice thing is that uh, the songs will will continue, and the and the musical uh, uh, compilations and the and the uh, working together. Yeah, mm. yeah, there will still be that opportunity, and then hopefully. You know, it depends on if my if my son stays here, then we'll come back and uh, visit. You know, uh, and of course, then of course I'll have to have a guitar to do that. Yes. And come back and yeah. play. Um, mm -hmm. So there's always that opportunity. But yeah. now it's possible to uh, play on the internet so that you can actually exchange songs back and forth all the time. And uh, there's a website I can I play on Street Jelly, which is a website that you live broadcast and it's a line it's a live busking thing where you actually get tokens for you get money for playing um, I play that and um, I could play that out in Oregon and you can listen to my music as I'm playing live and then you can make chat comments and stuff as I'm playing it's, mm -hmm. it's a, mm -hmm. another thing that the internet does that really pulls us together mm -hmm. yeah. now the um, you're gonna f play us out with uh, with a song that actually, oddly enough, it, you mentioned on tap uh, down in Essex. Uh, and I first went, uh, heard this song at an open mic there, Naked to the World. Mm -hmm. And it was all, I was always drawn to it. I had the uh, good uh, fortune of, of singing a little backup with you for uh, on that, uh, just at Arts in the Park yeah, a couple weeks ago. Fun. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the... Uh, the song uh, "Naked to the World" and this 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 stark persona that that is is there who, who is is really uh, you know at a loss in some ways. Or you tell me what what, what her situation it, it's is. It's kind of like I've always said about Van Gogh. The reason why Van Gogh was so good is that he didn't have any outer skin to the world, and that he really was naked to the world all the time and everything affected him. He was so emotional about everything and he was so sensitive to everything that he created things so purely uh, and that eventually the world just ate him up. You know, I mean, he just couldn't, he just couldn't survive that kind of uh, the world without having a, you know, that thick skin. And, uh, you know, the Naked to the World is about a person who doesn't matter who it is, you know, really, but it's a person who, um, is basically afraid to come out to the world and you know just kind of kind of hides and just has uh, had issues uh, adapting to the world since and I said since it was, since she was a little girl it could have been whoever it was but that idea that it, it, from their childhood they never had the ability to to deal with life and the world and you know they live in fear and you know I thought that that was kind of an interesting um, kind of thing to write about and I, it just kind of came to me one time I was just thinking about um, uh, actually it was stairway I was looking at a stairway and I got the idea about somebody that was so afraid of the world that they just would run up the stairways to get away you know they couldn't couldn't handle it and then it just kind of developed uh, mm -hmm. into that so that's what it's about. Well, it's a great tune and I want to thank, thank you, you for your for your yeah Wonderful conversation here, and yeah, your gift of music for yeah. the last four years it's or so. Me, I've, yeah. I've seen you, and the, uh, yeah, we're going to hear that song, and um, well, I'll catch you on the highway. Oh yeah. Uh, you look for uh, for Chuck Foster on the uh, on the internet, or uh, and um, you can keep watching for us here at uh, uh, Measure for Measure, and hopefully we'll have 
uh, more in-depth interviews with uh, with artists and see what what makes them tick and where their inspiration is is coming from and where it's leading. And uh, if you would like to uh, uh, possibly be the subject of an interview or or you have some suggestions for us, uh, it can be emailed at measure songwriters at gmail.com or you can like our Facebook page Measure for Measure and uh, thank you to, for, to Northwest uh, Access TV for having us here and uh, thank you Chuck Foster and we're going to uh, go out to hearing Naked to the World Without